It can be tough for my mind to come to terms with the fact that mankind in the mid 20th century deliberately created a destructive force that could wipe out virtually all life on Earth, the nuclear bomb. There are weapons in existence today that if a couple of keys were turned and a big red button was pressed, could arrive via missile and completely destroy my home city of Edinburgh, which is just over the water there, killing hundreds of thousands of people in the process. The nastiest of them all, the thermonuclear weapons, are as scary as it gets. We were so terrified of the force that we'd created that from the 1940s onwards, we started building facilities for our heads of state and military to stay in so that they'd survive a nuclear blast and continue leading the country. Believe it or not, underneath that farmhouse is a nuclear command bunker. And in today's video, we're gonna explore it and show how it would save you in a nuclear war. Built in 1951, just outside the sleepy fishing village of Anstruther in Fife, this bunker was kept top secret until the end of the Cold War, being abandoned in 1993. It has since been restored and turned into a museum. What's quite interesting is that this bunker was built on the specs of the Hiroshima bomb. Obviously, nuclear technology progressed massively onwards from that during the Cold War. So the owners have never been sure whether this facility would have survived a much more powerful thermonuclear explosion. There's gonna be some cool shit down there, isn't there? But before we delve deep underground, let's start with a quick lesson on how a nuclear bomb works. Starting with Otto Hahn, a pioneering German scientist in the 1930s, the discovery of nuclear energy almost instantly went down the road of building weapons. The US jumped on it first, with FDR giving the green light to the Manhattan Project, with the goal to make a bomb. One of the greatest theoretical physicists of all time, Julius Robert Oppenheimer, rallied together a team of mathematicians, engineers and scientists to create the first ever nuclear explosion. Named the Trinity Test, Oppenheimer and his team had officially christened the nuclear age. There was no going back from here. Atoms, the thing that literally everything in the universe is made out of, have a nucleus that contains protons, positively charged particles, and neutrons that have no charge. Keeping the protons compacted into the nucleus requires a serious amount of force, like forcing two opposing magnets together. By firing a neutron incredibly quickly at an atom, in this case of uranium-235 isotope, you can split the atom in two, smashing it apart, which leads to more neutrons being released, along with some heat energy. That then happens again, and again, and again, to form what is called a chain reaction. That leads to an exponential increase in heat energy in a fraction of a second. The recipe for an explosion, the size of this. In the grand scheme of things, however, a fission bomb is peanuts compared to a fusion or hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb is a whole other level of nope. It uses nuclear fusion to create a much, much bigger explosion. Nuclear fusion is when you combine the nuclei of two atoms into one heavier atom. Hydrogen atoms are positively charged, so they naturally repel each other. But by compressing them together, you reach a critical point where an explosion is possible. But that takes a huge amount of pressure and heat. We are talking in the tens of millions of degrees. A clever mathematician called Stan Ulam came up with a plan of using a fission bomb, an atomic bomb, to trigger a fusion reaction between hydrogen atoms to create what is called a thermonuclear explosion. So just to clarify, an atomic bomb is used essentially as a starter motor for a hydrogen bomb. Fusion is what the sun runs on. So by creating a thermonuclear explosion, mankind, for a split second, creates its own small sun. So let's say a thermonuclear weapon is dropped on your city and let's assume it's the biggest that has ever been exploded, a 57 megaton bomb. What happens next? 
Well, it's exploded in the air above the city to maximise the size of the blast, so it's not impeded by buildings or terrain. Also, the shockwave bounces back up off the ground, adding to the size of the blast. Anyone that can see the explosion will immediately be blinded by a light that is said to be brighter than a thousand suns, and everyone will incur serious retinal damage. Everyone within a three mile radius of the epicenter will be completely incinerated, vaporized by a fireball. That explosion then creates a massive shockwave that will get to a 16 mile radius, tearing through buildings like butter. Another result of that shockwave is debris will be flying absolutely everywhere, which will be incredibly deadly. So your city centre has been vaporised, the rest of it will be flattened or on fire. And if you've survived all of that, you then need to move very quickly and very decisively. One of the most important things in surviving a nuclear explosion is getting as much concrete between you and the blast as possible. Not only is this bunker 30 metres underground, but it's also encased in 10 feet of concrete. And also, it's obviously not hampered by weak points like windows and doors. It does have doors, but these things are 1.5 tonne blast doors. These things can take a serious shunt. The next stage actually kills far more people than the initial fireball and shockwave. Right now, there is a huge mushroom cloud that's towering miles above the epicenter. And that created so much air pressure that it sucked an enormous amount of dust up into the atmosphere. That dust then becomes radioactive and after just 30 minutes begins to fall back down to Earth. That is called nuclear fallout and it will kill hundreds of thousands of people in the following weeks. That is because the ionizing radiation literally tears your DNA apart and will give you illnesses like cancer and leukemia, but that is only if you've lived long enough to not die straight up of radiation poisoning. It can be weeks before it's safe to go outside. And in our simulation, over 700,000 people in and around Edinburgh will perish and over 900,000 people will suffer from major injuries from that radiation. This is the head of operations where the Minister of State could sit and govern the country from within the bunker. You can also see straight through there to the communications room where all the planning would be actioned. Communications would almost certainly be hampered with internet cables and telephone lines being disabled. So initially, radio would probably be the best form of communication. Any plans made in here would then be sent through via switchboard and coding machines to the outside world. They'd be sending out instructions, news and advice to everyone else out there. I've only ever seen displays like this in Star Wars, but it's amazing what it shows. It shows if certain bombs were dropped in certain places with wind speeds and direction, what people and where would be affected by the fallout? It's scary, but incredibly interesting. Apparently, they would play war games in here on a monthly basis. In a nuclear bunker, you have this. Down here, they call it the plant room, and it's essentially an industrial scale air purifier. It filters the air entering the bunker for radiation, nasty gases, any other forms of bio-warfare. It can shift 52,000 cubic feet of air every minute, meaning it can completely replace the air content in the bunker 14 times in 15 minutes. It is a major component to survival that our civilians living out there dealing with all of that fallout would massively miss out on. You will also be desperate for water and non-perishable foods, avoiding anything that could have got contaminated by radiation. For example, you wouldn't be wolfing down one of these on the reg. 
Another result of a thermonuclear explosion is that it creates an EMP, or electromagnetic pulse. That essentially kills anything that's running on electricity. Your best bet at home would be to find some spare batteries sitting around that you can put in battery-operated devices. This bunker is connected to the national grid, but predictably it also has a backup plan with its own powerhouse to generate its own energy. There could be up to 300 people working in here, which is a scarily small amount considering the apocalyptic scenes that would hypothetically be happening above ground. Also, when James May talks about loving a scratchy blanket, this is exactly what he means. Lukers, Turnhouse, these are airfields that have jet fighter squadrons at them, and they would be given a four minute warning of an impending nuclear attack to get every single aircraft scrambled and up into the air before the blast. Lukers and Kinloss are still active today, detecting Russian aircraft entering British airspace. I'm covering this subject matter today because I find it incredibly interesting, but thankfully, this place has never had to be used properly for what it was built for. It has been nearly 80 years since over 200,000 people were either killed or horrifically injured in the US bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. To this day, they are the only times that nuclear weapons have been used in war. Things are moving in the right direction, with the nuclear arsenal of the world decreasing over time. But the rate of change has massively slowed recently, and there's still 12,000 nuclear warheads spread out around the globe. 90% of them are owned by the USA and Russia. In the UK, things are getting very contentious on the subject year on year. Britain's nuclear arsenal, consisting of 225 Trident missiles sat in Vanguard-class submarines, is situated at Fast Lane in a sea lock on the west coast of Scotland, about 100 miles west from this bunker. But it's fair to say that the majority of Scottish people don't want them there. Firstly, because many don't see the need for them here anymore, and the fact that they're not in some incredibly remote part of the Highlands. The nuclear submarines are just 30 miles from Glasgow, Scotland's most populated city. If an enemy nuke was targeted at Faz Lane, Glasgow would easily be within the death zone. With Scottish independence being such a hot topic these days, could we see nukes heading away from Scotland? And could that theme spread to other countries, moving national security away from these frighteningly destructive genocidal weapons? After the Trinity test in July 1945, J. Robert Oppenheimer famously said this. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed, few people cried, most people were silent. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Many of the scientists, mathematicians and engineers that worked on the Manhattan Project were against things getting out of hand and the technology escalating further. They said that the information should be shared with the rest of the world, explaining that thermonuclear weapons were possible, but that there should be a treaty signed so that that technology never made it into the world. Sadly, those pleas fell on deaf ears, with too many US politicians and members of the military being too threatened by the Soviet Union. That led to things escalating from the 15 kiloton Hiroshima bomb to the 57 megaton Soviet Union Tsar Bomba. That thing was 3,800 times larger than the bomb that ended World War II. Today's video was about nuclear weapons, what next?